Okay, guys. This is 18.3. This is the last section in chapter 18. The rest of them will always get 18.2. Alright? So, 18.1 and 18.3. Guys, this chapter is just, you know, composed of three sections. So, this is the last one. The mobile FIR in India. In what is today called India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. So, when we talk about India now, it's not India the same as the country we know today. It's actually the Indian subcontinent, which means India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh before they were separated. The Mughal Empire, or the Mughal Empire as they to actually talk about it, uh, brought the Turks, Persians, and Indians together in a vast empire. So, we're still focusing on the main point that we focused on. Last time when we dis uh, discussed the Ottoman Empire, which is about the culture blending. <coughs> All right, this is actually the main theme of this chapter. How these empires actually could unify lots of people from different ethnic groups and come out with uh, a strange culture, uh, come from the blended or, or the cultures together. All right, these are most of the names and the terms that we're going to introduce. And this is the Mughal, Sikh, Pagur, Akbar, Shah Jahan, Taj Mahal, and Orangdin. And most of them are names for people as empty. We're starting from the Gupta Empire, and we have to follow the timeline. Alright? Follow with me the timeline because it's going to help us actually explain the lesson. And when we come to the part that we will have to read, then we will get used to the book. Uh, guys, we're going to start from this area, which was under the Doctor Empire back in the 1400s. Here, where the story starts, actually. We don't know a lot about the Doctor Empire. We just know that it wasn't that much organized, the same as other civilizations. This could be because of the period of time. Remember that it was 1400s. <laughs> now, we're going to start after the collapse, or let's say in the declining period of time of the Doctor Empire. What happened to this area? when the Gupta Empire collapsed in the 1400s. The area was lived in a way of, like you could say, unorganized way, scattered way, and that was from the 14th to the 1700s. So for 300 years, the people in this area were not living under like one roof or under one organization or under one central government. In the 1700s, people from Central Asia, from the Mongols, came and they were called the Mongols. Again, Mongols comes from Mongol. It depends on the way people in this area used to pronounce it. It's the same as Osman and Ottoman. Remember when you said that Europeans used to call him Ottoman, although his name was Osman. Alright? Now, 18 to 1000, there was a kind of problems between the people who were living in that area. Mostly they were either Muslims and Hindus. And there was this conflict between the Muslims and the Hindus for a big period of time, and most of the time the Muslims were outnumbered, sorry, the Hindus were outnumbered by the Muslims, so most of the time the Muslims were taking over. This has, these clashes have resulted from the Mongols who just devastated the whole thing and just left the area without any kind of control. What sounded? Turkish army came from this area of what is today Turkey, and they devastated everything. Actually, the Turkish had a very long history of like you know creating problems, same as our friends here. So I'm just kidding. Alright, so they devastated everything and then they just left the area and then they went out. They were not that much interested in the area, but I don't know, they just you know devastated everything. So that was during the time when the Turkish came on different times, like 17 attacks or 17 raids. They just raided on that area for 17 times. In Arabic we say, Hamla, Hamla, Ula, Wissani, Alright, this has resulted in this area of what is today the Indian subcontinent was ruled by different rulers. Each ruler, as long as they were Turkish, so they called themselves sultans, they were referred to as the Turkish warlords. Like every warlord used to take over an area, and like, you know, with a group of people, his supporters, I mean, he just, you know, claimed the authority over this or that area. So the area, the Indian subcontinent, was ruled by 33 warlords, 33 rulers. Now, that was from the 13th to the 1600s. 
until our friend Timur Dareem, the one we discussed in the Ottoman Empire, swept over this area and actually made a kind of long time of break when everything was jammed. The same as we talked about the Ottoman Empire when we just stopped or halted the expansion of the Ottomans at that time. Now, in 1494, a kid, 11 years old, was crowned and his name was Babur. You know, the names are typical, like you can say, for the people in that area. From the area that is today called Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, the area that we refer to today as Central Asia. Those countries that before the 1990s were part of the Soviet Union, and later on they gained their independence after the fall of the uh, Soviet Union. And he was considered as the founder of the Mughal Empire. Actually, because he was young, so he was just, you know, thrown away, let me say, exiled to another country, just nearby what is today Indian subcontinent, from Central Asia to Indian subcontinent, which is a close by area, where he started later on, okay, to establish or to found what was called later on the Mughal Empire. Now, later on we are going to talk about his son, his grandson and his son, sorry, his uh, grandson and the son of the grandson, and we're going to see each of them and their achievements or their contribution to the fall of this empire. We're going to read this one. Who can read this one, please? Yes, please, go ahead. The previous Gupta Empire was troubled and warlike Muslim tribes from Central Asia, part of North, Northwestern India, and many small kingdoms. As I said, many small kingdoms, each kingdom is ruled by a sultan or a warlord. Please go ahead. The people who invaded descended from Muslim Turks and Afghans. So, Muslim Turks and Afghans, so from the Central Asia. Please go ahead. Their leader was a descendant of Timur the Lame and Mongol conqueror. Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan. Okay, they call yeah. themselves. Uh, they call themselves Mongols. The Mongols or Mongols. means Mongols. So it comes from there origin as the Mongols. Yeah. Alright, during the 8th century, a long clash between the Hindus and the Muslims began with no winner. It's a true that the Muslims outnumber the Hindus, but still, this has not given them like 100% victory over the Hindus. In the year 1000, all right, a well trained Turkish army, as I said here, swept into India, leaving the region weak and devastated. Delhi, Delhi, the capital at that time, or one of the major cities at that time, became the capital of a loose empire to Turkish warlords called the Kilkis Sultanate, from the 13 to the 1600s, where 33 different sultans who treated the Hindus as conquered people. This could be the root of the problem that is still nowadays a little bit like between the Muslims and the Hindus. So, Timur the name destroyed the whole city of Delhi completely and according to one witness, for a month not even a bird moved into the city to show you how the devastation was complete. We're just here now. Now, Babur founds an empire, became a king of a small land in Central Asia, what is today called Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, in the present time, at the age of 11 years old. Can anybody in this age rule a country or an empire? Yes. 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 No. All right. No. <laughs> okay. no, 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 for sure, no. In this case, you will be young, so you will be, you will be helped by consultants or advisors. Babur was dethroned because he's young, so he cannot control the So he was dethroned and driven south into what is today Indian subcontinent, where he started to build up an army to reconquer India and lay down the foundation of what later became the vast empire of the Mongols or the Mughal Empire. However, after his death, so his job was just restricted to being the founder. After his death, come his son, Hamayun. And his son was totally opposite to his father. All the gain that his father did, he just lost it. He wasn't that much interested in expanding and, you know, making a whole empire. 
He lost most of the territory his father had gained, but later his grandson Akbar, who was 13 years old at that time, and see how they are taking responsibility when they are still young, took over the throne after Hamayun's death to start what was referred to later on as the golden age of this empire or the Mughal Empire. Let's see what did he achieve exactly. We're going to read something from here and then we're going to move a little bit to the book. Guys, please. Akbar means greatest or great Akbar, you know, in Arabic, the meaning. Ruled India from 1556 to 1605. How many years? Yeah. Okay. Remember what I said last time when I talked about Sulaiman? Sulaiman, the lawgiver? I said at that time, if you want to achieve. Then uh, lots of great achievements, you will have to have enough time. You can't do an achievement in two or three years. So he was given this chance. He ruled by two things wisdom and power at the same time. We're going to get some examples and we're going to see some examples about how he was wise and how he was powerful. First of all, he was a good military leader, a conqueror, yes, sir? Yes, sir. We'll see, we'll see now. How he was wise in managing the affairs of his empire. All right, in treating people of different ethnic groups in a fair way, so he just reduced tension to the minimum, and at the same time, how he was a good military leader, powerful, so he could expand the empire. Akbar recognized military power as the root of his strength. In his opinion, a king must always be aggressive so that his neighbors will not try to conquer him. Do you agree? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Oh, I the next one? Yes, I agree. Yes, if your neighbor fears you, then he's not going to dare even touch anything about taking it. So, Akbar used cannons, named native Indians Rajputs, he was in he actually gave them this name, as officers to turn potential enemies not allies. Like, for example, he was Muslim, but still he appointed Hindus in high ranking positions in the army to show them that there is no problem between you and that. There is no problem between Muslims and Hindus. Let's finish this long war between the Muslims and the Hindus. So instead of having people living in his empire might like be against him, he just you know, accepted them, tolerated them, and this is a good example about wisdom. So they turn to become allies rather than enemies. So, therefore, he had a combination of military power and political wisdom. We're going to be there when we start reading this paragraph about him. And From another side, he was a liberal ruler. What do we mean by liberal? Okay. Yes, Mr. He allows freedom. Freedom. Liberal comes from liberty. He allows freedom. So, let's get some examples about it. Akbar allowed religious freedom. For example, he was Muslim, but he got married from a Hindu prince. More than one friends, for sure. <laughs> Without forcing them to convert, he abolished taxes, or what we call in Islam, jizya for non-Muslims, to show them again that we are just one people. We treat you the same as we treat ourselves. Now, Akbar allowed all people a chance to serve in high governmental offices. We cannot just restrict the higher, the higher positions to Muslims. Everybody can be granted that disposition based on his or her qualifications, disregarding his religion. Hindu finance, for example, he allowed or he appointed a Hindu finance minister. And this Hindu finance minister actually was the one who uh, developed this new type of tax system that is still nearly followed today, which is a tax system based on the percentage and not based on a fixed amount. Let's read this one and then I'll explain it. Develop better tax plan similar to the present day US graduated income tax. It's based on the calculation, okay, that is based on the percentage of the value. For example, beforehand, everybody was supposed to pay a tax. Like, for example, let me say a fixed amount of money. Let's say, for example, 100 dirham. Yes, you will pay 100 dirham, I'll pay 100 dirham. Okay, but maybe your salary is 10,000 and my salary is 1,000. 
So the 100 from the 1,000 is something like 10 percent. But the 100 from the 10,000 is 1 percent. So it's not fair. Right? So he just changed the system to be based on the percentage. Like for example, everybody should pay an amount of 10 percent of his salary. So if your salary is 10,000, you will have to pay more than the one whose salary is 1,000. And this is fair, because your salary is better, is higher, so you will have to pay more. So, because this tax was fair and affordable, the number of the peasants who paid it increased. Therefore, the income grew, which means that the emperor became richer. And he started to use this money, additional money, to strengthen the army, so the strongest army will be taking over more lands. More lands means more resources and more people. It's like a chain gun, like a circle. Okay, more money means strength. Strength means being able to conquer more lands. More lands means more people. More fair treatment to these additional people means more income. And continue. Akbar gave land to his officials. Also, the land was, I mean, the empire was growing, so there was plenty of land. He started to build lands for his own officials, but he was smart enough. He didn't want to end up having his officials becoming very rich, because by the time he's giving them land, there will come a time when they will grow richer than the rest of the people. So he used to follow a very nice system. I'll give you a land because you are loyal to me, and you are loyal to the government, and you are loyal to the empire. But when we die, the land will be given to somebody else. In this case, all right, while you are living, you have a very good standing. Okay? But when you die, you cannot keep the same, uh, the same property, so you will be like, richer. So somebody else will take an advantage of this land. This kind of stuff. So he is not going to let the gap grow between the rich and the poor. So the rich will become richer and the poor will become poorer. Let's just read something about Akbar. Before we move to uh, his son, Babur's grandson was called Akbar, which means great, or Akbar certainly lived up to his name, because he was named Akbar and he really behaved as somebody who is great. Ruling India with wisdom and governance, as I said, for about 50 years, a military conqueror, Akbar recognized military power as the root of his strength. Again, in his opinion, a king must always be aggressive so his neighbors can fear him. I'm just quoting, I'm not going to read word by word. Now, Akbar, Akbar equipped his army with heavy artillery to give them the upper hand in case if they engaged in battlefields. Cannons enabled him to break into walled cities. What do you mean by walled cities? Like Russian. Remember when I showed you yeah, that yeah. Movie about uh, the city of Constantinople and I said that it was surrounded by a wall, heavy walls. So yes. heavy walls means actually heavy colors to be able to bring down this wall. In a brilliant move, he appointed some Rajputs as officers. I mean Hindu from different ethnic groups as high-ranking officers. That was very smart. That was wisdom and not power. The combination of military power and political wisdom enabled him to unify a land of at least 100 million people. So he grew his land and the inhabitants of his empire were more than 100 million people and everything was going okay. More than in all of Europe put together. So at that time he used to cover 100 million inhabitants, more than the total number of population in Europe at that time. And still everything was going okay. When it comes to wisdom again, liberal ruler, he was genius in cultural living. As Muslim, he continued the Islamic tradition of religious freedom. Yes, in Islam, we admit, they, we recognize the divine religions. So we don't have to force them to convert. And this is what he did. He permitted people of other religions to practice their faith. What the wrong of accepting, accepting others and letting them actually practice their faith? When you pray like this or you pray like this, I'm not going to be affected. This is something related to you and between you and your own God. He proved his tolerance by marrying a Hindu princess without forcing them to convert. That was okay for the people 
of the Hindu people. He allowed his wives to practice their religious rituals in the palace. In his own place, he was practicing his own religion as Muslim, and his wife, for example, was practicing her own religion as Hindu. Okay. He proved his tolerance again by abolishing the tax, as I said, the jizya. Akbar governed through a bureaucracy of officials, natives and foreigners. So it wasn't like all the positions restricted to the Muslims. Now, we talked about the tax system as well. Uh, yeah, and then we talked about the land that he used to give to these officials. This is mainly for him. Just one more thing actually before we move to another point, which is the culture of building. As Akbar extended the Mughal Empire, he welcomed influences from many cultures in the empire. This culture of building affected art, education, and politics and languages. So, for example, Persian was the language of Akbar's court and of high culture. The common people, however, spoke Hindi, because there were lots of people from India. A language derived from Sanskrit. Sanskrit. So, see how the languages were talking about it. Persian, Hindi, Sanskrit. Hindi remains one of the most widely spoken languages in India. Out of the Mughal army were said, soldiers were of many backgrounds. Alright, came yet another new language which is called Urdu, which is today the official language of Pakistan. Yeah. yeah, so it was formed actually at that period of time due to the mixing between the soldiers from different ethnic groups. So to be able to understand each other, they come up with a language that is called Urdu, which means this language that the title Urdu means from the soldiers' camp. And two, it was actually founded because of those soldiers who were living in the same camp and they were from different backgrounds. Which is a language that is blended from Arabic, Persian, Hindi, and today it's, as I said, the official language of Pakistan. When it comes to arts and literature, the arts flourished at the Mughal court, especially in the form of book illustrations. Highly detailed, colorful paintings were called the miniatures. Sorry, miniatures. These were brought a peak of perfection in the Safavid Empire. So again, his land was very close to Central Asia, to Persia. Part of the Turkish people who were living in that area were still under his rule. So he made that kind of blending of these cultures. The Hindu literature also enjoyed a revival in Akbar time. The poet, he just you know, made a poet for example, uh, I don't want to go into details here, he retold the epic love story of Rama and Sita, these uh, like traditional uh, roots, if we say, in the culture of the Hindus. When it comes to architecture, he devoted himself to architecture. The style developed under his reign is still till today known as the Akbar period architecture. Just imagine, as long as he was totally fond of architecture, there is a period of time that was named after him. And what makes it even important is, is one thing that I, I, I'd like to read about, the capital city of Fatihpur Sikri is one of the most important examples of this type of architecture. Akbar had this red stone city <coughs> built to them the Sufi saint, Sheikh Salim Shisti, who had predicted the birth of his first son. So he just made the whole city done of uh, red sandstone, actually, which is still found today, like buildings made of red sandstone. And this was actually his style of architecture, and still this city is found today. So, can you stop here? Yes.